Great. So we have been working with what's called DC circuits for a while. And the idea behind DC circuits, it stands for direct current. And it's uh, circuits where the uh, potential that's generated by the power source is a constant and therefore the current is a constant, right? And um, that's fine. And there's a lot of things very simple about those kind of setups and learning the basics of circuits is good when you do DC stuff. However, um, there are advantages and practical applications to having what are called AC circuits. That stands for alternating current. And one of the reasons why it exists, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it exists. What? What are you talking about, engineer? I don't know anything about that. Um, so the, um, the, I mean, there's a lot of practical applications. For example, one of the things you saw, we did electromagnetic induction, was how some basic generators work. If you rotate a current loop in a magnetic field, uh, you, if you rotate a current loop in a magnetic field, you can generate an alternating source of current. Uh, yeah, current uh, loop in a, in a magnetic field, you can generate an alternating current. So um, you can easily generate these things. And um, when you have uh, circuit elements in combination with each other, uh, there is actually some really interesting behavior that comes out of rapidly alternating things. Uh, as you might realize, the inductor plays a large role in this because it responds to changes, uh, whereas resistors and capacitors don't need to have change to make them work, but they do have a response as well. Okay, so um, this graph is showing a basic sinusoidal uh, AC generated uh, power source. We're going to stick with sinusoidal functions uh, because they just have a nice mathematical way to ex to be expressed. Um, the things that we're talking about here do not necessarily need to be sinusoidal. There's a lot of other types of oscillatory signals you can have. Uh, we're not going to delve in, into any of those because we want to learn the real basics of AC circuits. And uh, it can be established with um, the trig functions. And um, a lot of the ideas can be applied to other types of alternating currents. So we write our um, EMF as uh, E naught, which is the peak EMF, uh, cosine omega t. Uh, we using a we don't have to use a cosine function. You can use the sine function. Just it's typical to use cosine function because uh, without a phase shift, it starts at the peak. It doesn't need to do, but it's just easier to do that. Omega is angular frequency, and uh, what you might remember, of course, you all remember because you love it so much that the value for omega is given by two pi f or F is the oscillation frequency. And the oscillation frequency is what is at the core of a lot of this stuff. Here in the land of the free, we have 60 Hertz as our AC stuff. Over in the place across the water, they use a 50 Hertz source. Don't know the history behind these things. I know it's 60 is a nice divisible by a lot of things. I really don't understand. I don't know the 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 historical back round. Boy, you guys really have some problem with the homework. My goodness. Uh Canvas must have had been having a meltdown or something because I just got like a 18 emails like in the last few minutes. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay, so anyway, uh, typically the frequency is given by 60 hertz if we're dealing with the stuff you plug in your walls. Um, otherwise, we have it specified, but um, it's the omega here is related to f by multiplying by 2 pi. Okay, so um, we have a mathematical way that we illustrate the behavior of these functions. One of the things you might remember from trigonometry 
is sine and cosine functions have a circular nature to them. In fact, one of the definitions of the sine and cosine functions are um, values uh, on a unit circle. So for a given angle, the sine and cosine function represent the x and y, uh, well, cosine and sine represent x and y respectively on a unit circle. So there's a circular nature to them. In fact, when you rotate an arrow like this, or rotate a vector, um, the cosine is the x component of that and the sine is the y component. And they oscillate with a phase that's different by 90 degrees because of the nature of the rotation here. Um, and we're going to use these, actually, to analyze our AC problems. Uh, we call these phasers instead of vectors. A phaser is a vector that rotates. The default orientation for the phaser is it starts like angles do in standard um, form along the positive x-axis, and they rotate counterclockwise. The rotation is given by the angular frequency. That's um, basically the angle that's rotated per second, it's radians per second. Um, the cosine of omega t will specify the x component of the phaser here, which is our instantaneous EMF. The max values for EMF are given here. And um, the actual angle that's specified here, which we call the phase angle, is given by omega times t. So the t dictates, you know, what position it's at. Omega is the speed. Um, just to be clear, to remind you of some of these equations, um, omega is given by 2 pi over t. So if you know the period, you can figure out omega that way too. All right. Um, this is our cosine function here over one cycle. And so we can see how the EMF varies over that cycle. It starts off at a maximum value. After a fourth of the period, it reaches zero when the phaser is directly vertical, going along the positive y-axis. Um, then we're along the negative x-axis after a half period. We're now at the negative y-axis, back to the positive x-axis. So that's the shape of the function over time. And we can visualize it like this, or we visualize it with the phaser. Now we go back and forth to do that. Now, an individual phaser is not too interesting, just like individual vectors are not very interesting, but the combination of vectors, the combination of phasers, um, and their sums are very interesting. So, this is a current phaser. The magnitude of the instantaneous value of the phaser is doing what? What's going on with the instantaneous value of the current? What do you have to say? A... I can get behind A because it's right. So what we have here is we have our current, instantaneous current being given by the peak current, cosine, omega t, which we could say. And right now we're in quadrant four. The behavior of the cosine function in quadrant four is right there. It's an increase in function. Or just remember that the phaser rotates counterclockwise, so as it rotates towards the positive x-axis, the instantaneous value of the current is going to increase. I made a little mistake here, actually. We don't use the capital I for this. Instantaneous values use lower cases. So it should look more like that, lowercase i. Excellent. Let's jump into an example right away. What is the angular frequency, frequency, and instantaneous EMF? for the following setup here. Let's do it. Mm, here we go. All right, so this phaser is given by E naught, cosine omega t. The angular frequency, well, the phase angle, which in this case is 150 degrees, as the angle made with the positive x-axis, it's five pi over six. And so we set that equal to omega t. We know that t is given at 15 milliseconds. So we'll divide that by the 15 milliseconds and we get omega being 135 radians per second. If we wanna figure out what the frequency is, two pi f, 
equals omega. So omega over 2 pi. We have omega from before. Don't use 175, though. That's rounded. You don't want to use a rounded value in a calculation. Okay. You should, you know, one, one thing. So this is Thanksgiving's coming up, right? Be thankful for not being a person that rounds their numbers and puts them in the calculations. That's what I'm thankful for. Just so you know. I have kids and stuff, but I'm thankful for math. So 135 divided by 2 pi, 28 hertz. I rounded that. I didn't round anything until I write the numbers down. But, um, you know, 5 pi over 6 divided by 15 times 10 to the minus 3, whatever that number is, that's divided by 2 pi. Okay. And then we want to know their instantaneous EMF, so that means what is the component, the X component here of this phaser? Well, it would be given by basically, I mean, I can put in the phase angle here, 5 pi over 6, which you should. Don't put 30 degrees because that will give you a positive value. And the phaser does have a negative uh the component has a negative value. So it's a minus 10, again, rounded, uh, minus 10 volts there. So what that means is that the polarity of the battery has flipped. Half the time, the polarity of the battery is flipped, and the current's going the other way. So current's pushed through one way for half a period, and it flips, push the other way, with varying intensity, of course. Excellent. Another example. 60 hertz source of EMF has a peak voltage of 170 volts. We want to draw the EMF phaser at 3 milliseconds. So the question, if we're going to draw the phaser at 3 milliseconds, we're going to have to know what is the phase angle. That's how you draw the phaser, right? The length of the phaser is irrelevant, at least for this problem here. Irrelevant because the length is arbitrary. You can make the length as long or short as you like. It's when you put a second phaser in that you start to care about that length. So I put an arbitrary length to the phaser here, but with 60 hertz, we wanna figure out what the phase angle is there. The phase angle is given by omega t, which omega is two pi f. So I can put in all my numbers here to figure out what that angle is gonna be. You got two pi, my frequency is 60 times three milliseconds, 64.8 when I put it into degrees. I mean, this is the radians, which I can tell is a little under 90. So we're not even a, a quarter of the way uh, through here. In fact, what's the period? The period is two pi over omega. Well, that's F actually. So the period is one over 60. So the period is point, the period is 16.6, Milliseconds. I just want to make sure we would, we didn't go around once already, but um, the period is is much longer than this. So this is really the first rotation, and we're not even a quarter of the way through. So I draw what is approximately a 64.8 degree angle. I'll be honest, I didn't use a protractor to draw this. I just kind of eyeballed it, which is perfectly fine to do in a problem like this. If you need to be more precise, though, um, use a protractor. So what we want to do here is you want to go through each of the circuit elements we've discussed and see how they behave in an AC environment. So capital letter I, capital letter V, that's for DC current and voltage. As I previously mentioned, if we are dealing with AC stuff, we're going to use the lowercase symbols. Now, let me warn you right now, okay? For those of you moving on and doing more things with circuits because you're going to be electrical engineering, other kinds of engineering, computer science, maybe you just like this stuff and now it's a hobby for you, whatever. Physics has their set of notation and then engineering has a completely different set of notation. And unfortunately, the two bodies of thought cannot get together and say, let's speak the same language. So I'm just warning you, this is the standards in physics. And one complaint I've heard is they get to engineer and all the symbols are different. All right, well, nothing I can do about that, unfortunately. That sucks. But 
hopefully you learn this stuff enough that the issue that you're experiencing is not just different looking symbols. Put it that way. So hopefully that will not be the issue for you. All right, lowercase i, lowercase r. Um, using a subscript R here to indicate we are thinking about the res the current going through the resistor here. That's not too standard, to be honest, notation. But for the purpose of understanding this stuff, I think it's okay. All right. Now, instantaneous values still obey all the things we've talked about. So Ohm's law in an instantaneous state does equal, you know, V equals IR. It's peak values that do not obey. The reason why is because current and voltage can peak at different times. And as a result of that, the peak values will not necessarily obey Ohm's law. Okay, you'll see that more as we get through things here. All right, so with this resistor circuit here, it's real basic. We have an EMF alternating current source and a single resistor. So, the EMF is given by cosine omega t according to Ohm's law. Um, the current would be given by the voltage over the resistance, which fortunately matches what the EMF, the EMF source is. So the peak in this particular case does obey Ohm's law. Instantaneous values do obey Ohm's law. And we say that the current and the EMF are in phase, in phase. By saying they're in phase is they peak at the same time, they dip at the same time, they become zero at the same time. That makes resistors very simple in that sense. Easy peasy, right? If we wanna draw out the phasers for these, we would draw two vectors, rotating vectors, right? Um, you probably wanna draw them with different lengths, although they have different units. So still, their lengths are somewhat arbitrary um, because these do have units on them. So drawing one bigger than the other is not really much of an issue. But if you wanted to deal with absolute numbers, you may wanna consider making one shorter if uh, if the just the value of the number is shorter. Um, but they're all lined up, they're all in phase. This stuff rotates together. Okay, not a very interesting thing. Capacitors, now it gets more interesting. Capacitors, we have a current that will come through here. Uh, and what that does is it charges and discharges and charges and discharges the capacitor repeatedly over and over and over again. And so that's the effect on this. So by having a current oscillating back and forth, you're going to have charge coming off, coming back on, and that will oscillate the voltage of this. Okay, now, if we just have the capacitor hooked up with EMF source, then we're thinking about the charge, right? The charge on here is going to be given by the capacitor equation, which is C times V. Now, if there's only a capacitor here, and we're thinking about loop law, then the instantaneous potential difference across the EMF is going to be equal to the potential difference across the capacitor here. So we can put in for VC here, VC cosine omega t, because that omega t, cosine omega t, matches what the EMF is doing. So we're saying they're the same. Now the current's another story though, right? Because the current is not given by an equation for capacitors, we're going to have to physically take the derivative of Q with respect to T, and that's what the current's going to be. So if I take the derivative of that expression for charge given by the capacitor equation, I'm going to get a minus sign out of that. And omega comes to the front as part of the derivative, and now I have here minus omega CV sine t. Now, I want to be able to properly compare my voltage, instantaneous voltage, and instantaneous current. So I'm going to use a trig identity here, just identifying the fact that sine and cosine are off by a 90 degree phase. And it just so happens that minus sine is cosine x plus pi over 2. 
So I'm going to rewrite this with a cosine. Okay, so I have my EMF in a cosine, and I have my current in a cosine, but the cosine here has a phase shift of pi over 2. Here are the graphs for these things. So start with the voltage. Voltage is as we expect, a nice cosine function. But the current, we say, leads the voltage here. So they are not in phase. There's a 90 degree phase difference, which means a one quarter period difference between them. The current peaks first, then the voltage peaks. That's why we say the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees in phase. So imagine you walk along the time axis. Okay, so what happens? The voltage peaks, the current is at zero. The capacitor is fully charged at that point. As it starts to discharge, current goes in the other direction. When the voltage reaches zero, the current has now reached a maximum value. You've pushed all the charge off there. The capacitor is now starting to be charged with an opposite polarity that drives the current down as we build up the charge on the capacitor. And then the current goes to zero as the capacitor now gets fully recharged with an opposite polarity. Anyway, the process continues here, but as we move along the time axis, you will see that the peak in the current happens first, later the peak in the voltage happens. So that's why we use this terminology, current leads a voltage by 90 degrees. Current peaks first, voltage peaks later. And this is all due to the nature of having the alternating current, ha, sorry, having the alternating EMF source and you're charging and discharging and charging and discharging back and forth, back and forth. And it creates this oscillatory nature to the capacitor. Here's how the phasers are gonna look. You'd have to draw out the phaser for the current to be 90 degrees in front of the phaser for the voltage, okay, because it leads. Uh, whatever the phase angle is for the EMF, that will determine what the voltage phaser is. And of course, you simply add 90 degrees to that to get your current one. Okay, so you can see how the instantaneous values for these two are going to work, given the angles here. These, ve these phasers here are the peaks. They rotate around. Okay. Question for you here. In the circuit represented by these phasers, which is not necessarily what we've been working with, the current does what with the voltage? What's the language that I would use here? B is right. So because this rotates counterclockwise, the voltage will peak first and the current peaks second. So we would use the language of lag here as opposed to lead. In the circuit represented by these graphs, what would you say the current is doing compared to the voltage, given the graphs now? The current here lags. I think a lot of you are saying A. Let's go back here. You're saying A? Yeah, a lot of you are saying A. So if you move along the time axis here, right, you see voltage peaks, then the current. Move along, voltage peaks, then the current. Okay? Now, I mean, obviously you could argue like, oh, okay, look, current peaks, then voltage. Well, the closest the peaks are together is how you determine this. So here the voltage will do that. Notice these L's on here. I wonder what that's all about, huh? Maybe it has something to do with inductors. It does. It does. All right. Now, that peak current is the coefficient that sits in front of that cosine function. It's an omega C VC. Hmm, that's interesting because the peak current is a function of the frequency. That may seem very surprising. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna rewrite this expression in a really interesting way. Um, as you know, Ohm's law is given by V equals, you know, IR, 
So if we want to write this to make it look a little bit like Ohm's law, which is, again, strange because this is capacitors, and we don't really have an Ohm's law for capacitors, but if we identify omega c as in its reciprocal form, 1 over omega c, then we can rewrite this max current expression up here as ic equals vc over xc, which is basically what Ohm's law is. And in fact, this has a behavior that looks very similar to Ohm's law. And that capacitor, when it's in an alternating current setup, does have resistive-like properties to it. We call this the capacitive reactance. And the capacitive reactance is determined by the frequency of the EMF source and what the capacitor is. And when your frequency is very low, the reactance is very high, okay? So that means that when the oscillations don't occur very fast, this is like it has an effectively very large resistance. You don't generate a lot of current given a particular voltage. Um, when the frequency is very high, the capacitive reactance does go down because this follows a 1 over x relationship. That's the idea here. When the capacitive reactance is, um, sorry, when the frequency is very high, the capacitive reactance is, is very small, indicating it doesn't act very much like a resistive element. It's, uh, the oscillations are very quick, and so that can, that can generate a decent amount of current because of how you're rapidly charging and discharging. So C is, you know, C is the amount of charge it can withstand, and omega is sort of a rate at which it dumps charge on and off. So if, you know, your value of C, for example, could be, could be very, very large. And um, that would drive this. So, okay. If the value of the capacitive reactance is doubled. Sorry, if the value of the capacitance is doubled, the capacitive reactance does what? Okay, B is good. All right, double it. The two's on the bottom. That cuts the capacitive reactance in half. So, all right, good. So if the capacitive reactance is cut in half, you can generate more current that way. So, all right. Oh, ha. if the, okay, well, similar question, but uh, the value of the capacitance is double, the peak current becomes what? All right, C is right, not even gonna give you a chance. So anything is pretty straightforward. The C occurs in the coefficient, right? Okay. Sounds good. Let's do a problem. Okay, we got a 20 nanofarad capacitor connected across an AC generator with a peak voltage of 5 volts. We want to know what the frequency, what, what frequency is the peak current 50 milliamps? Okay, at what frequency is the peak current that? Well, Peak current, right, is given by omega Vc times the capacitance. The peak voltage, that's our five. The current that we want to search for is 50 milliamps. We want to know the frequency, so we're going to have to rewrite omega as 2 pi f. We want to solve for f here. So we got a peak current on top, 2 pi CVC in the down here. Put all your numbers in, 50 milliamps on the top here, 2 pi, 5 for the volts, 20 times 10 to the minus 9 for the nanofarads. And the frequency that pops out of this is 80,000 hertz. I'll put it as 80 kilohertz. So 80 kilohertz. Now it says, what is the instantaneous value of the EMF at the instant when the current reaches that peak? Well, there's a 90 degree phase difference between the two, right? So if the current's peaking, that means the voltage must be zero because at that point, your capacitor has been fully discharged. So I can draw this down here. I mean, this is my nice cosine function for the EMF source, which is also the same as the capacitor.
then the current, right, which is going to lead by 90 degrees, it's going to peak first. So when it peaks, voltage is zero. Here it is peaking again, voltage is zero. Again, the meaning behind this is that the current is the maximum once the capacitor has been discharged. And there's no voltage across it. Excellent. Okay. Now, let me just see what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm getting into inductors today or not. Let me just check my notes here. Too many pages up. What's the date? The 25th. So I'm talking about filter circuits. That's cool. I don't think I'm getting into inductors today. No, not today. Okay, so the rest of the time here, we're going to investigate what happens when you throw together a resistor and a capacitor. Now you might remember what happened way back in the days of the DC, of DC circuits, but um, having a resistor and a capacitor together in a DC setup resulted in an exponential decay of the capacitor. So that's what happens in DC. Here, the oscillating source is still gonna do the same thing in terms of charging, discharging, charging, discharging back and forth. But with the resistor in there, it adds an additional element that resists current. And depending on what your frequency is, there may be a stronger signal that's right out of your resistance or a stronger signal that's right out of the capacitor here. And so when we're thinking about loop law, we can talk about, okay, well, whatever the, um, you know, the voltage is instantaneously across the EMF source that is split up among R and C. But depending on, again, the frequency, there may be a bigger signal across R or a big signal across C. That's why this is referred to as a filter circuit. By adjusting the frequency, you can adjust the relative voltage across these elements here. You can make a stronger signal across R or a stronger signal across C. And so this allows you to filter things. Okay, let's look at the math behind this though. Um, yeah, let's look at the math here. All right, now, question for you here to lead into this discussion. Does the peak resistance voltage and the peak capacitor voltage equal the peak of the EMF source? The answer is no. This is not true because the instantaneous values obey this loop law, but instantaneous uh, but peak voltages don't. Why? Because they're not in phase. The peaks happen at different times. Here's how we're going to do the phasers for the RC setup, okay? Now, individually, they still have the same kind of behavior. The RC, the, the resistor is still in phase with the MF source, and the capacitor is going to lead, right? So we're going to draw out what the current phaser is going to look like, okay? Uh, and this is going to be our starting point here, basically. Um, because in terms of instantaneous values, right? I mean, even though it's an oscillating thing here, instantaneous values are still always gonna have the same current. Okay, that's the idea. So, and don't worry about the angle for now. Okay, now we're gonna draw out what the phasers are gonna look like, okay? So the resistor phaser is in phase. So we draw that along I. The capacitor, and the current leads the capacitor voltage by 90 degrees. So we draw a 90 degree angle here, and that corresponds to the two phasers that we have. Okay, so this is at some arbitrary phase angle here, but they will always look like this and will rotate as a system like this, okay? Now, the combination of these two, okay? So while it's true, that um, VR, geez, um, 
Come on. Zoom. It wasn't Zoom's fault, but I'm still going to blame Zoom for this. Actually, it was Zoom's fault. No, it was, it was PowerPoint's fault. All right, so these instant instantaneous values do not add up. However, the phasers do. So I'll draw these as vectors. And this is true. That's true. As phasers, they add up. Okay? So, and the instantaneous values follow that as well. So, we can see here that the EMF of the power source, right, instantaneously has to be the sum of these two. So, we create a triangle out of this. So, if you want to actually figure out how the current relates to the EMF, we have to draw out what the peak phasors um, are for the resistor of the capacitor and then resolve what the, uh, the EMF phasor is. And you can see here that all obviously depends greatly on the length of these. So if the capacitor can have a much higher peak, that means the current's gonna lead a lot more because the capacitor will control the circuit. If the resistor peak voltage is very large, then that's largely gonna control the current and they're gonna be closely, not in phase, but closer to being in phase. So we do a little Pythagorean theorem here and we come up with this statement at the bottom. Now this is true for the magnitude, this would be the magnitude of peaks and they do obey the Pythagorean theorem. So that, that is one thing you can say. Okay, so now let's write this stuff out in terms of current. So VR, okay, can be written as I times R. Again, this is all peak stuff here, so we're able to do this for peaks. IR for uh, the peak resistor voltage. Uh, for the capacitor, we're gonna write this in terms of the capacitive reactant, so IXC. So I'm plugging in those values here. There's an I squared in both. I'm gonna take that out. And I'm gonna write the capacitive reactance in terms of the angular frequency here. And so this statement here is our relationship between current and the peak EMF, peak current and peak EMF. And um, so you can solve for I here and you can plug them into the original uh, statements for what the voltage across the resistor and capacitor is here. And you come up with these pretty interesting functions here. So this states what the peak values of these are in terms of frequency. Okay, so there's a very strange radical constant plus one over x function here. This has a one over x divided by radical constant plus one over x squared function. So these are strange functions to be sure. They look like this here. Um, so yeah, the nature of these functions are, are you know sort of very strange here. This function at the top here is our capacitor voltage one. And then the bottom one here is the resistor voltage function. So these two functions plotted by frequency are right here. And so let's try to understand what's going on here. If the frequency is very, very low, the capacitor sort of dominates the voltage here, right? And that's the stat which that's because of the capacitive reactance. We saw that already with just having the capacitor by itself. The frequency is very low, then what dominates is the voltage across the capacitor. If you get the high frequencies, very high frequencies, then the capacitor voltage doesn't play a major role and instead the resistor plays a major role in what's going on here. And so this is why it acts as a filter because altering the frequency can make one particular circuit element have a much larger response and the other circuit element will respond strongly if the frequency is pushed up. Now there is a place where these things cross, right? So what you have to do is you go to these equations here, set them equal to each other, solve for omega. Fun little algebraic activity there. If you have something, if it's something you need to do later today. But when you work out what that 
value is you get one over RC. And that's what we call the crossover frequency. That's when the voltages, the peak voltages for these are gonna be the same. If you lower below the crossover frequency, you filter in signals across the capacitor. And if you up it beyond the crossover frequency, you're filtering things to the resistor voltage. So that's, that's a, a neat little device, basically. And uh, one of the ways that this is, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll explain to you right now. This is how the filters are sort of used here. Um, so uh, say that we have our output voltage across the capacitor here. Okay, so if the um, frequency is very low, we're going to have a large signal across here, and these frequencies get transmitted through. And if the frequency is too high, they get blocked. So we call this a low pass filter because any source with high frequency won't get through. Okay, this is a very common setup in like noise reduction software, for example. Um, a lot of times filter not noise comes from having high frequency signals in the noise. And so if you pass, like, for example, some kind of like sound wave through this that has, you know, all kinds of alternating, uh, you know, peaks and troughs and things like that, then the uh, higher frequencies get blocked and you, and you just get the lower ones come through. And so that can filter out a lot of sound or you have a high pass filter. High pass filters when you're concentrated on the output being across the resistor. And so this will transmit signals that are frequencies that are very high and blocks the frequencies that are low. Again, if you have a signal where there's low, a lot of low frequencies that are, um, maybe that's noise as well or something. So um, all, you know, and so, we don't have necessarily have to have a power source, by the way, just to be clear, we don't have to have a power source that's to alternate in a nice sinusoidal way. We can put through a signal that has a very complicated type of oscillation to it. And, uh, and again, this filters out frequencies depending on what we want to consider our output to be. Okay, so I guess I have one problem and then we're, we'll wrap this up for now. Let's do that last problem here. A capacitor is connected to a 15 kilohertz oscillator. The peak current is 65 milliamps when the peak voltage is six. What's the value of the capacitance? All right, so we wanna work with capacitive reactance here. Um, we have our frequency, so we have omega. We have the peak current and we have the peak voltage. So we wanna work at the capacitances. We're gonna shuffle the stuff around, solve for C. Current gotta be 65 times 10 to the minus three. Make sure for kilohertz you put in 15,000. And, um, boy, this should have been an earlier example, I guess. This doesn't really relate to the filter stuff. But anyway, 115 nanofarads is what we get for the capacitor there. 